Hey guys, welcome to Marathon 99. I'm so glad you, you joined me. This is, uh, oh man, these things are so much fun to me. I've been away from YouTube for a, a little over a week, actually, and I'm, I'm running low on work with my regular job. This is the first summer I've had where I can have just a regular life, you know, get off at a normal time or not even work for four or five days at a time and get to do some things I've been needing to do. And I, I actually took a vacation last week. I, I went to the uh, central Arkansas to the Little Red River. My family has a cabin over there. All my kids and my grandkids spent a week at the Little Red River. Cabin's right on the river. We just had a ball. We swam in the lake. We found some creeks to float. Did a lot of trout fishing, picnics, all kind of stuff. And the kids loved it. And it was just a big, big time. But I've neglected YouTube. I'm back in the saddle. Maybe I can get a video up. Maybe every day, maybe probably every other day. Marathon 100's coming up. I don't know how to make that special. <laughs> I just don't know what to do. Maybe I'll make it an hour long. Anyway, I'm going to shut up. We're going to get rolling with this video. I got four Bigfoot stories in this. I hope you guys enjoy them. All right, here we go. Here's an email from a woman named Cricket. She lives in eastern Kentucky, and here's what she writes. I live in McCreary County in eastern Kentucky. I have been here most of my life. Growing up, we heard all sorts of stories about strange things in these mountains. My mother and father would tell us these stories, and when you come from Appalachia in Kentucky, those stories somehow become part of your everyday life, or at least it was for me and my cousins and my little brother. My grandfather moved his wife and my mother to Cincinnati when they were younger so he could find work. This was common in those days. Families moved to and from larger cities, doing their best to make a better life. At some point, my mother's baby sister died of crib death while they were in Cincinnati. In order for my grandma to somehow come to terms with losing her baby, she was visited by social services. My mom had one brother that was just a year or two older than the baby, and it had also died of crib death, and somehow, someway, Cincinnati Social Services managed to take him and place him with another family. There was no hope of getting him back, and crib death wasn't even heard of back then, so automatically foul play was suspected, but that was not the case. There were eight children still in the house, so to avoid any further confusion and heartache, my grandfather brought them back to eastern Kentucky near Yamacraw, which is part of the Daniel Boone National Forest. They moved into a small farmhouse, which was the last place on the road on top of the mountain. There were other families on that road, one of which was my father's family. There were other houses on that road, too, and most seemed to be related. Families in those mountains were rooted deep, and most usually stayed there. This is all relevant to this story, so keep all this in mind. My father began seeing my mother after they moved back to Kentucky. My grandfather didn't approve of the relationship because my father had been married once, but was soon divorced after. Added to that, my father was a known moonshiner in the area, and he was also four years older than my mother. Nonetheless, my mother would sneak out of the house late at night and meet my father on a long trail that ran through the mountains to spend time with him. They would meet in a spot called Grandpa Hill. It was secluded and probably a romantic place to spend time with someone she loved. Mom said there were many nights when Dad would walk her back to the house and they could hear something walking in the woods beside them. When they would stop, so did the walking. One night on top of the hill, they were standing beneath a big tree and something fell out and went right between their jaws while they were kissing. She said all they could see was a small branch. Dad thought it was Grandpa and hurriedly got her back home that night. Six months later, they were together visiting one of my father's aunts. Her house sat back up underneath a cliff line. 
A young child was crying and the women were trying to settle the child down when they heard a terrifying scream and something moving on top of the house. It was banging around and it began shaking the chimney. They thought something was about to come down the chimney and they were in a state of horror. The aunt told them that it was probably a panther after the baby because it was crying and to not go outside. The woman had seen these big cats on other occasions, and she was certain of it. I've seen them too, by the way. Big cats live in eastern Kentucky. Make no mistake about that. Things eventually settled down, and they were all able to visit. Later that night, my parents started the walk back home. As soon as they were out of eyesight of the house, something again began to pace them in the woods. They could hear it just like on Grandpa's Hill a few months earlier. They kept walking and listening to their stalker not far off in the woods as it walked step for step with them. And then my father recalled a time when an uncle was walking with him and his brother down the same road. They came around a curve by the old schoolhouse and the uncle caught sight of a large shadow-like creature in the road ahead. It quickly moved off into the woods and was out of sight. Their uncle made them run with him all the way to the house. The event my parents were experiencing brought back memories my father had suppressed, and it all started to connect with him. They finally made it home without incident and went their separate ways. Several years ago, my grandfather, my father, and his brother were spending a few days camped out on the South Fork River. They knew that river well, having grown up there. There was a story my grandfather would tell about a woman who lived in the area. Her name was Maggie, and she had a beautiful head of red hair. She had no home, and she would ride her mule from house to house, offering to help around the place for food and a place to stay. On a summer night, she was leaving the home of one of my relatives. She traveled a short distance on the way to the next house to offer help when she ran into some rowdy men drinking up in the woods. The story goes that they did some horrible things to her that night and they wound up killing her. To do away with the evidence, they sank her body in the South Fork and she was not heard from again. Some say they found her body floating in the river a few days later, but I don't know the whole story. Back to the men camping on the South Fork. At some point, they ran out of whatever they were drinking, and the two young brothers made the trip out to get more. When they returned at midnight, their father wasn't where they had left him. They looked for a while and finally saw his light way down the river. They soon caught up with him, and my grandfather, who wasn't afraid of anything, said that he had heard a woman screaming in the distance and had gone to see if he could help. He described the scream as if a woman was being murdered. He would move towards the scream, and whatever was doing the screaming would move the same distance away. The screaming eventually stopped about the time the brothers showed up, and they came on back to camp. Grandfather told them that he remembered the story of Maggie, and he wondered if it could have been her ghost. He was shaken up a bit. My father later told me that he had never once seen that man afraid of anything until that night. I think it was a Bigfoot screaming in those woods. Now here is my encounter. During the spring, our families would gather together and plant one big garden. The kids were told to go off and play while the adults hoed their rows and planted whatever they wanted to grow. I was running and playing with my cousins, and I saw something move in the trees. I moved closer to the movement. I was curious, of course, but I didn't see anything. Satisfied it had been nothing, I bent down to tie my shoe and dust off my corduroy pants, and I saw the movement again just ahead of me. I stood up straight, and I looked at the spot, and wrapped around the trunk of a sapling, I saw dark, thick fingers. I followed the fingers back behind the tree and I saw a thick arm and then I could make out the whole body. It was dark and it was covered in hair. I didn't get a good look at its face, but I locked eyes with this thing. And in the blink of an eye, 
It was gone. I never saw it move. It just vanished. Later that summer, on a hot, still evening, I remember being on the porch with my grandmother. She began yelling for my grandfather to get those kids out of her garden. She yelled at him to tell them to stop running around like crazies with her wigs on their head. She had seen something big and with long hair running around in her garden in the moonlight. I clearly remember my grandfather yelling back at her, that it was not the boys. They had not yet returned from a carnival in Stearns that night. Now, what did she see? These are just a few of my memories and stories that I heard growing up in those Kentucky mountains that have to do with Bigfoot. There are many more, and not all are about long-haired wild men running through the woods. These mountains hold thousands of strange stories. I hope you will read this story in a video if you see fit. Thank you all and God bless. Signed, Cricket. <laughs> oh, that's a great that's a great set of stories. These are memories that she's had growing up in those mountains all her life. I actually lived in Kentucky for about 10 years. I lived in central Kentucky, Lexington to be exact. Part of my district was the mountains of eastern Kentucky. Now, there was not a lot of economy going on over there in the building economy. But from time to time, I would travel over there. And let me tell you, those I, th there's something about those mountains. Now, this is not the exact spot she's talking about. This is a little further south and more to the west. But the eastern Kentucky mountains, they're, I think they're called Sawtooth Mountains. They're real steep and jagged. And man, when the sun goes down, it gets dark in those mountains real quick. And the roads are windy. And I can just imagine all the stories that come out of those areas and the history of Appalachia and the people that settled that area and still live there today with all the wives' tales and true stories that go on. I have family that lives in Middle Tennessee. That's not that. That's not Appalachia, but they still have those mountain kind of stories. I don't know. I'm just rambling. But it's it's all real intriguing to me, and I, I, I love these stories. Cricket, thank you so much for taking the time to send this. She sent this about a year ago, and I'm just now getting to it, and I, and I loved it. I really loved it. So thank you for sending it. Here's a story from a man in Arkansas, and he wants to keep his name out of it. He writes, about eight years ago, a friend and I had set up a game camera at an area in Arkansas where we thought there should be some wild pigs. There was an old homestead that belonged to his brother-in-law. It was 80 acres of woodland that, for the most part, was straight up and down. The only level area on the property was at the top, and it was about three acres where the house had once sat. We spent several seasons deer hunting there, and had always harvested venison every time we went. The game camera had been there for about six months. He called me at work one day and wanted me to pick him up after work so we could go change the batteries and put a new chip in the camera. I picked him up around 6 p.m., and by the time we got to the farm, as we called it, it was close to 10 o'clock at night. There was a full moon that night. Our tree stand was about 80 yards up the side of this hill from where we had the camera and a feeder station set up in what we call the kill zone. When we got down to the kill zone, something small scampered off into the darkness real quick. We didn't see what it was, but I remember it sounding as though it was bipedal. That didn't register with me until after this incident was over. We changed out the batteries and put a new chip in the camera, and then we climbed up the hill to our tree stand, which was just a small shack built into the side of the hill. I put the old chip into my camera so we could take a few minutes to view the photos. We had only been there a few moments when something screamed at us from the other side of the ravine, and it was loud. A long, undulating intonation unlike anything either of us had ever heard. And it was close. The other side of the ravine was just 150 yards away. And whatever this thing was, it was angry. We looked at each other and we both had a startled, puzzled look on our faces. He asked me, what the hell was that? And my response was, I don't effing know. 
I jacked around in my pistol and he took the safety off of his 3030 rifle. And we sat there for a moment and quickly decided to get out of there. I spent every free moment for the next week searching the internet for every animal sound that I could find that would be in our area. And it wasn't a bear or a mountain lion or bobcats fighting. No animal in our area could make that sound. And then my friend sent me a link to a gorilla in a zoo making a similar noise. But it wasn't the same. We were both on the hunt for whatever made the sound that night. A few days later, he sent me another YouTube link called Bigfoot in Arizona. Along about the three-minute mark, there is a recording of that sound again. Only this time, the animal was probably a mile away across the canyon. I always believed there was a possibility of the existence of Bigfoot, but I never would have thought that we would have them in Arkansas. But that recording made me a believer. I later discovered that the county the farm was located in got its nickname from these creatures. The old-timers from the 1800s and into the 1900s knew of their existence. They called them wood boogers. They were prevalent in the area, and the county got the nickname of Booger County. As everything began to settle in my mind and start to make sense, the bipedal scampering we heard that night made sense as well. What happened that night became clear to me. To my mind, what happened was that we startled or frightened a small infant Bigfoot eating corn at the feeder station, and then it scampered off to find its mother. The mother then came to let her presence known in a way that we understood and that she was not to be trifled with. Since that time, every time I go there, alone or otherwise, I find tree structures and other signs of their presence on the property. I have even noticed that when we kill a deer, we could come back to the kill site an hour or so later, and there would be no gut pile where we field dressed our kill. Although I have no solid evidence for their existence from this experience, I am convinced that they are real and that they are in this area. So much so that I no longer feel confident going into that area alone at night, even if I am armed. And every time I notice the moon is full, it makes me remember that night. I found out later that the two oldest sons of the property owner have taken their kids camping to that hunting area several times, and their boys can mimic the scream that my friend and I heard that night, though not with the volume and intensity that we experienced. So they have heard it as well, and I know that it scared them. The only thing that I could think when I heard their story was, why did you spend the night there with your kids with that thing screaming like that? I would like to get a recording of that scream for the sake of credibility, possibly any other evidence as well. And I've tried to do just that, but the property is just too far away and my job makes it difficult to invest the time. This experience has changed me. I now believe in the existence of Bigfoot. I no longer am relaxed and or confident when I'm in those woods, and I closely inspect and question things in the woods that I would have given no notice to before this happened, such as sounds or the lack thereof. I am no longer safe in the knowledge that I am the apex predator in those woods. The non-believers can hate on this story all they want. All I can say in response is that a man with experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. Thank you, and he signs his name, and I appreciate it. Man, you're not going to catch any crap or any hate on this story from anybody on this channel. We just love the stories, and, and I appreciate you so much. For, I mean, that was, a, that was a scary experience at night. I mean, anytime you run into something like that at night, it just, it, it quadruples the intensity of it. So I, I kind of, I, I've never experienced it, but I kind of feel what you're feeling. I've been in the woods at night and been a little creeped out with nothing going on. I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to hear something screaming at me, but I appreciate you putting this evidence 
into writing and sending it to us. I know every, and some of the researchers who listen to this channel will probably get a lot out of it. Very credible report. I, I really enjoyed it. And it's a good story. So thank you, sir, for sending it. We all enjoyed it. This email is from Kate, and Kate writes, My experiences would start as a child of around four years of age, but would continue for many years. When I was a little girl growing up in West Auburn, Maine, we had a horse farm and 60 acres of woods behind our four pastures. We lived in the country. I was born in 1959 and in my younger years was visited often by what I thought was a nightmare. A gorilla in my window and I would start screaming. I was so scared. My bedroom was on the second story and his face took up the whole window. For many years, I thought I was dreaming it. I had that dream a lot. My mother would find me standing in front of that window screaming and think that I had a nightmare. Until recently when I read that Sasquatch liked to look in windows and it was then I realized that I was not dreaming. They had approached me in my younger years. I spent a lot of time in our woods riding my horse, cross-country skiing or long walks and digging for old bottles. We had two ponds and a flowing stream about 15 feet or so wide that separated our property from the local ski area. While back there, there were a lot of eerie silences at times. I remember noticing that it was so quiet. It was almost like time stood still. In 1979, I had some friends that lived in Sebago Lake in Maine in a cabin in the middle of the woods on a long hilly road only traveled by the residents. You could go up and down it and not expect to see any other cars. I was driving up there one night. It was curvy, and I was coming around the last bend in the road, and there on the side of the road was at least an 8 to 10 foot tall giant Sasquatch. He was massive. He had to be 4 foot across, shoulder to shoulder. He was brownish blonde. He had a heavy brow, high cheekbones. His skin was dark. He looked sort of bearded and kind of like he had bangs, and he had a big head. He looked both ape-like and human-like in that he was on two legs. His hair looked thick, and I'm guessing it was three to four inches long all over. He stood there motionless just looking at me. I was freaked out when my headlights were on him, and we actually made contact, and he was not ten feet from me. I sped past, I flew into my friend's driveway, and I ran in screaming that I had seen a huge Bigfoot. Later, in North Gotham, Maine, we had a pig roast up on our hill at our cabin, which was very rustic. Plastic on the windows, we had a rope handle on the door, a metal ladder going to the second floor, which was our bedroom. I had a friend visiting from Colorado, and my boyfriend and his friends went out on the snowmobiles. We were hanging out inside the cabin, and we started hearing these growls like no noise I've ever heard before or since. The noises got louder and louder, and then whatever this was started making these screams, and the cabin began to shake. We could see claws coming through the plastic on the windows. I ran towards the door and put the broom handle through the loop in the door, and as I did, something was pulling and shaking the door on the other side. Every time we changed our position in the cabin, that side would be attacked, and we were terrified. My boyfriend had brought a gun and bullets, and I, who had never seen one before, suddenly and instinctively knew how to load it. But neither I or my friend, who was a male, were going to step foot outdoors. We climbed the ladder, and whatever that screeching thing was landed on the roof above us. The screams were the scariest things you have ever heard, and they're impossible to repeat. Just as we thought we were going to die, we could hear the snowmobiles coming back, and whatever that thing was finally ran off. We told the guys what had happened, and they went out to look for tracks. At first, they thought we were crazy until they saw the claw marks on the plastic windows. 
I have since moved out to Colorado, and I spoke to a girl out there of my experiences. She told me that she had had a telepathic experience through the window with a Sasquatch. She was going up her stairs, and there on the landing between the stairs was a Sasquatch in her window. It told her that they wanted to communicate with people, but because of their size and scary appearance, they run or they shoot at them. It conveyed that there were once dinosaurs and other animals that had gone extinct, and they are here to warn us of what is to come. They had to look enough like us, but also be of a prehistoric man with its survival instincts. I had put these experiences out of my mind. I had buried them until I saw people speaking of their experiences on YouTube, and it all came back to me. All of the pictures that I see that people have taken really don't look like the Sasquatch that I saw, except for one, and that gave me an instant flashback. Signed, Kate. Wow, Kate, you've had a, like, a, like you said, a lifetime of experience with these things. I'm not jealous in that, I've, you know, I don't want to be in a cabin and be attacked by a Sasquatch. But I'm kind of jealous of a lot of you people who have seen these things over and over and over and have constant experiences. There must be something in the psyche or, I, I don't know, some kind of ESP or something where they can tell what kind of person you are. And it, I'm not saying if they don't communicate with you or let you see them that you're a bad person, but there's some quality about some people that they 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 will reveal themselves in some way. I just it's just fascinating to me. Kate, thanks for writing this down for us. We all enjoyed it, and we really appreciate you sending it in. Thank you, ma'am. This is an email from Walt. Walt has a blog on the internet i'm going to link it below in the description it looks like he covers a lot of he blogs about bigfoot quite a bit so if you'd like to go over and read some of his blogging the link will be below it's pretty good i read two or three of them it's pretty good stuff and he links to other videos and things like that but here's what walt writes my name is walt and i'm 61 years old i'm a retired veteran on November the 6th, 2019, I went from being a Sasquatch believer to a Sasquatch knower. Nothing I've read or watched had prepared me for the encounter. In the ninth grade, a friend of mine gave me a book entitled Strange Creatures from Time and Space. It's a tongue-in-cheek narrative of all things that go bump or glow in the dark. Bigfoot was among them. I was already a UFO knower, but that's another story. Over the years, my opinion of Bigfoot was skeptical at best. I watched all the documentaries. When I watched Science Meet Sasquatch, and my skepticism started to fade. I bought the book and became a believer. The bell curve graph of Sasquatch foot length appealed to the mathematician in me. Numbers do not lie. In 2017, we moved from Las Vegas, Nevada to Charleston, South Carolina. I have been in and out of Charleston for 11 years and wanted to retire there. My grandchildren live there. My daughter wanted to go to college in South Carolina. I wanted to retire to a place that reminded me of what California used to be with trees and an ocean. The prospect of doing some squatching was on my mind. The Marion Francis National Forest beckoned to me. According to the BFRO, there are not many Bigfoot sightings in South Carolina. I think that's because they're called boogers, not Bigfoot, around here. The locals have stories of the Ashley River Swamp Monster. When we settled into our new home, I did not think I'd stumble onto any big feet. However, one morning, waiting for a credit union to open up, I saw a Bigfoot stick structure right at the edge of the parking lot. I investigated, I took pictures, and posted the event on my blog. Now for the good part. On the 6th of November, 2018, I drove my daughter back to college. I dropped her off and got back on the road around midnight. It was a beautiful night. I roared down Highway 71 at speeds a patrolman would frown at. By 1.30, I had passed a couple of cars that had run off the road and was feeling guilty for not stopping. 
It was then that I spotted the blue lights. My GPS had taught my GPS showed that the highway patrol had pulled someone over about a mile ahead. So I took my Kia Soul out of light speed. I was in the right lane. The shoulder of the road was small. There was about 30 feet of tall grass and then the massive tree line. The moon was full and there was a lot of light of the towns and the cities being reflected from the cloud cover. Visibility was not a problem. It was then that I saw a man stand up in the grass. He steadied himself with his arms out and then flopped back down. I slowed down further and wondered if the troopers hadn't found him and maybe he was hurt from a wreck. I was preparing to stop and render aid when this thing came at me in the grass. I was bewildered because it definitely wasn't a man. I had read all about Bigfoot in the turbo mode, but that had not prepared me for what I saw. I swear to God that it looked like a huge hairy spider coming at me with all arms and legs. My speed had dropped to about the 40s as it came closer and now looked like a soldier doing a low crawl, but much too fast. When we passed each other, everything slowed down for me like when you think you're going to crash. I did have the thought flash through my mind that it would leap onto the pavement and that I would hit him. I remember every detail as we passed. It was at a range of zero. If someone were in the passenger seat, they could have rolled down the window and touched it. Every window on the right side of the car was filled with the darkest black fur that I've ever seen. I saw no heads, no hands or feet, just fur and rippling muscles. I snapped out of it in time to swerve onto the left lane and pass the speeder and the trooper. This happened on Highway 71 north of Columbia, South Carolina. I didn't stop to get a GPS location. All I wanted to do was get home. All the way to my exit home, I was talking to myself, trying to digest what I had just seen. That was a black bear. That was a black bear. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Shut up. No, it wasn't. When I got home, I Googled black bears in South Carolina, and I found that there are two groups, the coastal group and the inland group. These are separated by a wide margin right down to the center of the state. Guess where my encounter was? Right in the middle of the parts of South Carolina that the bears don't want to go. I told my wife that I was afraid to go in the woods now. Are you afraid of trees now, she asked. No, I just don't want to come across a Bigfoot. But you like Bigfoot. I do, but I also like lions and I like to see them in the zoo. I do not want to come across a Bigfoot in the forest. And that's where I'm at right now with Bigfoot. I don't want to come across one in the forest and bet my life that it's a friendly and loving creature. I love your show and I love your accent. Uh, Signed, Walt Chamberlain. Walt, (laughs) thanks for the... I I say it all the time when I get these these (laughs) encounters where people pass them in cars. That's how I want to see one. But it sounds like he was real close to your car. That's a spooky encounter, and now you're a knower. You've seen it. I haven't. I'm jealous. What can I say? But it's a great story, and you guys go over to Walt's uh, blog site. The link will be below. I can't remember what it's called. I was actually reading it this morning, but it's it's a good blog, so you guys go check it out. Thanks again, Walt. I really appreciate you, buddy. Thanks again for watching Marathon 98. I hope you guys enjoyed those stories, and I'll be... I'm back at it again. I'll be putting out, I'm going to try to put out a video at least one every two days, maybe one a day for the next four or five days, because I just love doing this. But thanks again for listening, and we'll see you guys on the next one, hopefully tomorrow. Thanks again. Mm